I think that there are two kinds of organizational structure. There's the vertical where, you know, most of us think of this as the structure of the organization. It's the org chart. You know who your boss is. You know who reports to you. This is where performance evaluation takes place. Usually this is where budgeting takes place. And the authority is very clear in this kind of structure. But as soon as you move to the horizontal structure, the cross-functional teams, you're taking people from different departments and putting them together on an initiative or a task force or a project team. And these groups behave very differently. And we don't think about that when we go through our day, you know, 9 a.m. I'm in my vertical team meeting with my own team and 10 a.m. suddenly I'm walking into a different meeting that behaves almost like it's a different planet. We need to be more aware of that change, I think. There's very good research, literally hundreds of studies on the problems of cross-functional teams, but I wanna just point out a couple of them on this slide. Welcome to Transformation Talks. I'm uh, Tairo Hassan, uh, the director of uh, Brightline at uh, the Project Management Institute. And the title of our talk today would be the best laid plans, solving for people in strategy. We often say strategies about people. So let's see what we'll hear today. And we know, actually, when we talk about execution, the best laid plans come apart when the time to understand who is going to do the work and also who is going to make the decision about the new plan. Uh, there is not too much clarity. And this we know usually and actually most often strategy execution involves cross-functional works across departments. And uh, we often say that uh, we need diverse team. We need everybody to be involved. However, there is extensive research that is showing the, and talking to us about the challenges that you have when you are in cross-functional works. And uh, usually in the context of this cross-functional works and the challenge that we see is often unclear roles and uh, the need for multiple ap ap approvals. And at the end, the strategy execution just bogs down. The best laid plan do not get implemented and we don't get the results. And then everybody gets frustrated and, and the outcomes are not the careers could be destroyed. This then creates a huge loss of impact and value. There is good news. There is good news. There is a way out of it. And we are fortunate really to, to mention that the classic RACI tool, which is widely adopted by project professionals across the globe, can be tailored to help solve people-related problems in strategy execution. Why? RACI actually, or RACI explicitly calls about decision-making. Make, so it is more explicit, and which is really critically important when you're in cross-functional teams, as you attempt to implement strategy at speed and at scale, and as we know, in a world that is rapidly changing. In this talk, we'll be fortunate to hear real examples of people-related pitfalls in strategy execution and how they can be avoided. And to talk about it, I'm really privileged and honored to welcome Cassie Solomon, who is CEO of RACI Solutions, and Max Horst Mikkelsen, who works with a partnership at Decide Act. Cassie is the founder of Rusty Solutions and the New Group Consulting, Inc. As we will see, uh, I need to say, Cassie is an expert in change and, and she's worked worldwide with senior leaders to improve decision-making practices in their organization. The work that she does accelerate time to market and also encourage empowerment. Cassie was educated as Yale, Payne, Wharton, as a system thinker. Her work streamlines teamwork, and also strengthens culture in a complex organization. And she's also trained as a futurist at the Institute of the Future in Paulo Alto, and she teaches at the Wharton School of Business. I need to mention a great book that she produced. Uh, the book is Leading Successful Change, Eight Keys to Making Change Work, and it is published by Wharton School Press. And she's co-authored it with Gregory and uh, really, the book helps leaders successfully navigate the ever-increasing pace of change. Joining Cassie is Mark, 
And Mark has over 25 years of experience with strategy execution management. In fact, his PhD from Copenhagen Business School is on how to maximize the impact of strategy execution. He's an expert in digitization and automatization. He's actually an expert in digitization and automation of strategy execution, more specifically when you are looking to enhance speed, quality, and impact in business transformations. Mac has written several publications on strategy execution, and he helped many organizations to develop best practices in strategy execution. So as you can see, we'll be well served. Cassie, Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Tyru. What an exciting group to be here from all over the world. I've always said I think that RACI is a global tool, um, and now I am convinced. One thing I wanted to add to that nice introduction that you gave, Tyru, is that this book um, has my co-author, Greg Shea's um, system design model in it. And there's a distinction between change management and change design. I really think this is a fantastic change model. One of the eight levers that you can use to design a successful change is decision-making. And that's the one we're focusing on in today's webinar. It's an invisible part of all of our organizations and it's very hard to, to reach in and kind of work with it if you don't have a language uh, like RACI to help you il illuminate it. Mark, do you wanna add anything about Decide Act before we move on? Yeah, first of all, I'm, I'm very happy to be here and thanks for the introduction to Hero. One thing that I'd like to, to share with you is that over the last 20, 25 years, I have been looking for game, cha game changes in strategy execution. And the, the reason one I, I, I realized a couple of years ago uh, was when you digitize the process of strategy execution, you really get the opportunity to to, to really move faster. And, and that is uh, extremely exciting. And um, I spent now quite an amount of time working with the site app, if, if you could change the slide, uh, Cassie, uh, it's, which, which offers a uh, cloud-based uh, digital platform for strategy execution. And, and what I really like about that is that it can be configured to the exact way of thinking behind your strategy. So, so if you have a, an approach called objectives, key risks, or must win battles or balance scorecard even, or whatever methodology you use, then that can be configured. And that goes hand in hand with one of the main conclusions from the PhD that I did on strategy execution, which was that uh, if you really wanna succeed, you need to understand the logic behind the strategy and the way the executive management team thinks about strategy. So uh, what you do is in line with that. So uh, that was it about that. Cassie, back to you. So the, at the very high level, everyone on this call knows that the pace of change is accelerating faster every day. When I started my work as a futurist about five years ago, I ran across Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum telling us that we are in the beginning of the fourth industrial revolution. And what amazed me when I began to learn this was that this revolution that we have started is anticipated to take place in only 15 years. And all the previous revolutions, steam to electric and agricultural to steam and electric to um, computer took place over 70 to 80 years. So the fact that we can feel this incredible speed around us is a result of that, I think. This is some lovely research that shows that faster organizations outperform. And I just wanna call out a couple of things that in innovation, 4.8 times fast companies exceed the performance of slower companies. Growth is three times faster than slow companies. And if that was all we saw, we might say, well, I can't push my organization, Cassie. I don't wanna break my people. Uh, I don't want to lose my talent, but the thing that really jumps off of this slide for me is that employees are 2.7 times happier in the high growth companies than they are in the slow companies. And this really matches what I see in the work that I do with companies who often reach out because of employee engagement scores not being where they want them to be. And they recognize that the problem is often in their decision making and their ability to move fast. So Mark, this one's you. 
Yeah, actually, just move forward uh, one slide, uh, because in, in line with what Cassie just said, um, I'm referring now to a recent analysis uh, on strat global strategy execution, and that showed that companies that respond to quickly to change with uh, what we call high quality decisions are two to three times uh, more likely to succeed with their strategies. And uh, just going to give you an example, which is a leading European producer of uh, building materials that we work with. And, and they had a very uh, ambitious growth strategy. And then they acquired one of their competitors in the middle of a quite critical phase of that strategy execution. So what they did was that they defined some the critical decisions for each of their strategic initiatives. And then they made sure that the most competent people from the acquired company were in fact onboarded into this decision-making structure. And that made them able to respond quite quickly to change. And decisions were taken not just uh, very fast, but also by the right people. So it's not about hurrying, but, but, but doing it in an intelligent way. And that ended up being one of the key reasons for them to achieve their financial targets, in fact, two months before the deadline by the end of the year. So um, it's about moving fast and doing the right things and have the right people making the decisions. Um, and if you move one ahead, Cassie. Then on the other hand, if you move too slowly, it will lead to a declining growth. You'll get fewer customers and you'll get um, uh, major losses of profit. And in fact, the the company I just talked about, uh, well, they, they were not succeeding with everything they did. In fact, they, they, they for one of their core markets, they missed to put the recruitment of a new chief commercial offer on the critical hiring list. And so they ended up suddenly being in a hurry. They hired the wrong person in the first case before they find the right candidate. But they actually lost about five mo months in that um, in that process and, and, and were lacking critical leadership. So it's it's about all the time being on top of what needs to get done and decided and 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 move fast. So we have our first poll and we'd love to ask Rohit, please launch it so that people can respond. Um, Mark, we have a question in the chat. So while people are voting, um, mm -hmm. it's for you. Can you define strategy the way that you're using it? I think you you just started to do that really. Uh, it's the things that you do and the way that you do them and who and the yeah, decisions well, that you make, but you probably have a more formal Yeah, answer. well, where I always begin the definition of, of strategy is what brings value to the customer. So the strategy should identify what is most needed to uh, create more value in, in the business area that where you're working in. And, and therefore you need to be on top of, of the, the, the critical buying criteria and find out what you need to do to, to make the customers choose you and to give them a great experience and um, be the ones who advocate for you uh, when they have bought your pros, your products and afterwards. So it's all about creating value for customers, if that helps. I also want to say that because I, my roots are in organizational change and that is my background and my training, um, but I've moved more of my practice into strategic planning because very few companies are standing still. And so often strategy does involve changing the way that you do things or trying something new, moving into a new market, um, doing things in a new way combining with another company, which involves lots of change and integration, trying to see how many people we have. I asked this question when I teach at Wharton, and the, the, the percentage has really changed uh, over the last five years. So let me just share the results of this poll out with everyone. So almost a third of the people on the call are feeling a sense of urgency about moving faster everywhere. Uh, and about 20% are, no, we're not feeling that urgency yet. Uh, and really the winning answer here is 70, uh, 57% is, uh, yes, feeling a sense of urgency in some areas, but not in others. And I think that can really be um, a difficulty and a challenge for implementing and executing strategy because you can uh, hit places in an organization where they don't feel that they need to do things differently. So... Mark's going to talk to us about this one. And how dear him, I see your question. So hold on. When Mark is done, we'll tackle that one. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Yeah, so so what you have in front of you are some of the challenge that, challenges that we often meet when we help companies digitize their strategy execution. And the shared denominator of all these challenges is that they somehow have to do with uh, people and um, role confusion to some extent. So, um, so that's um, something that 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 is quite important to have in mind. And uh, I was when I see this, I, I think of this example, which is a, a company that we work with, uh, which is a leading construction com- construction company in in Europe, and and they had moved into a new business area where they were losing speed and momentum in their strategy execution. So 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 top management was not at all satisfied with that progress that they. They didn't get what they expected, and all the cross-functional uh, initiatives seemed to get stuck over and over again. And 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 when they found out that that the 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 problems were rooted in 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 this people and role confusion issues, what they did was that they gave all managers in that business area that that was the the key problem a fast track training course in how to work with roles and responsibilities and strategy execution and then combined with a clear uh, governance around it and efficient tracking and monitoring they actually did get back on track in, in their ex- uh, strategy execution so that was one example Cassie, i don't know if you have anything here to to add or if you want to uh, no, but I love the way that you explained their solution because it really is systems thinking. They did training and they did governance and they did clarifying the task. And that's really, I think, the the right approach to change. So let me talk a little bit and get to your comment, Mark, about cross-functional work. I think that there are two kinds of organizational structure. There's the vertical where you know, most of us think of this as the structure of the organization. It's the org chart. You know who your boss is. You know who reports to you. This is where performance evaluation takes place. Usually, this is where budgeting takes place. And the authority is very clear in this kind of structure. But as soon as you move to the horizontal structure, the cross-functional teams, you're taking people from different departments and putting them together on an initiative or a task force or a project team. And these groups behave very differently. And we don't think about that when we go through our day, you know, 9 a.m. I'm in my vertical team meeting with my own team and 10 a.m. Suddenly I'm walking into a different meeting that behaves almost like it's a different planet. We need to be more aware of that change, I think. There's very good research, literally hundreds of studies on the problems of cross-functional teams, but I wanna just point out a couple of them on this slide. Unclear governance, I think that is very much a problem we can solve um, by reviving RACI. Uh, Lack of accountability is the same. And all of these other issues, staying on schedule, this one is often a problem because people are having to choose between delivering something for their vertical boss or choosing to deliver something for their horizontal teammates. And they always choose their vertical boss because that's where the authority is clear. So these these groups can get stuck very easily. Mark, I think you have an excellent example of this from one of the companies you've worked with. Yeah, which which is a a leading European producer of of sound equipment. And they have some great brands. And the thing is that the different brand directors, they 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 tend to tend it to compete about the the key persons in that organization. So 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 they those key persons they were having a, a tough time because everyone wanted them to join their strategic projects and uh, and some of them actually got very stressed and had to stop for a while and get back and stuff. So so that was a tough one and there was always um, misunderstandings about roles and decisions were not made in time and uh, budgets were, were, were not met and their time to market was not satisfying in any way because uh, the, it was always delayed so so what they did was that they, they streamlined the the you could say their cross-functional project management process and 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 apart from that they 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 put all those key persons in one resource pool and then they made sure that uh, or they started actually to have the executive management team to meet every second week to discuss 
what could get done to remove obstacles. And, and, and then they started to have a much more holistic company-wide perspective on those cross-functional initiatives. And they realized the costs of not getting the progress that they wanted. So, 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 so if, if, if a project was worth uh, 200 million in a year, well, if you lose one month, then you can do the, the math yourself. And, and, and that's a huge cost. So that was the example I think you were having in mind, Cassie. Uh, that is reminding me about a company that my team is working with right now, which is a global tech company in California. And, and I love the, the graphic for this slide, this kind of foggy landscape, because I think when we're working in the horizontal world, it's, it's like this. You can't always see what is going on in other parts of the company on the same project. But in this company that I'm thinking of, they, they either have no clear decision maker uh, because no one wants to step forward and take the risk or they have too many. And that's very common in cross-functional teamwork because every single department has authority over its own domain. You know, In this case, legal and regulatory, their whole job is to minimize risk for this company and product, their whole job is to optimize the product. But then there are country owners who have responsibility for the PL trying to navigate the, the role confusion. And I think one of the things I'll say now, but also later, is that RACI as a tool is very simple. Most of us have used it for a long time. It's actually the negotiation about role that it, that it surfaces that is not simple. Um, and I think project managers often get stuck in the role of like, why, why can't you just do the RACI? and straighten it out. And it's really about negotiating authority, which is much more complex and often not something that they that they can do. So Rohit, we have, we have a second poll. Please run this one. We are curious about how much cross-functional work you are doing. So I think across 100% of your job, how much of the time do you think you're working cross-functionally? And then just focusing on that uh, part of your work, how much of that time do you think you are wasting? That's not what I wanted to do. I do have two theories I want to share with you while the answers to this poll are coming in. And one is that the higher you go in your career, the more cross-functional work you will find yourself doing. Um, if you think about it, executive teams are by nature, as a team, cross-functional. They bring together all of the functional expertise of the company at the top. But the other thing is that there are certain roles that are, by definition, horizontal roles. And those people spend an enormous amount of their time in that 75 to 100% of their time working cross-functionally. So they often are um, really interested in straightening out some of these role confusions that we've identified. People often also say to me, I wish I could get out of these meetings that I'm in. I'm so frustrated and go back to my real job. And I think what they're actually saying is they want to go back to their vertical job because they feel effective and competent in their vertical, and they feel hamstrung and unable to move forward effectively when they get into the horizontal. So I'm going to wait for just a few more people. Okay, go ahead. I think I'm going to end the poll, share results with uh, the people who have answered. Thank you so much. So very few people on our call today are not spending any time working cross-functionally. We have uh, almost a a horse race, uh, almost a tie between a quarter to half, half to three quarters, and some lucky people, 46 people are doing a lot of their work cross-functionally. And so now we have our second question of that time, how much do you think is unproductive? Not too much from almost 40% of you, which is great, up to half from a third of you and uh, about a quarter of you said uh, half to three quarters of my time is unproductive. So my heart goes out to you. Um, there's actually a fantastic application of RACI to meeting effectiveness that we don't have time to get into today, but um, we'll make resources available uh, after the seminar. So I, I just want to ask people to put into the chat so I can take a look. How many people here are already familiar with this tool, with RACI? You've used it before. You you know what it is. Um, I, I want to very quickly go through it, especially if everyone here, yes, many of you, familiar, yes, familiar, yes, good. Um, I want to point out in that case, just one difference about what um, 
my team calls RACI 2.0. And John and Tyru, this is a difference that we have with the Project Management Institute because the PMI defines the A as accountable. In many places that I go, that's, that's confusing to people. Uh, it just it, it makes it unclear what is the difference between the R and the A. Um, and so we've changed it a bit. Um, we say that the R is responsible for doing work. This is usually a role associated with creating deliverables. And the A we define as authorized or approver. And this means that we're really tightening up the definition of A to mean the person who makes the decision. C's, as you all know, are advice givers and I's are informed. With the company that I'm working with in California, they have a consensus culture and they're very inclusive. It's a lovely place to work. But the downside of that consensus culture is that there are many, many A's. And as PMI says, that is not efficient. So persuading people to move from an A for every decision to a C uh, can really be a shift that streamlines your work for strategy execution, trying to get down to that best practice of one A. Um, and this is, this is where the negotiation about role comes in. Not as easy as just building the chart, but saying to someone, uh, look, we have too many A's for this decision and we need to have just one. So would you like to volunteer to just be a C on this decision and having that conversation? We also have one other difference. We say that if there is more than one R for an activity or a task, that it's best practice to introduce this R prime code so that one person is responsible for orchestrating the work of all of the others kind of like a symphony conductor it is not playing all of the instruments, but they know, you know, if someone has fallen asleep at the drums or if the flutes are off key. And this R prime role also gives you more efficiency and speed. This is the classic racy chart. Uh, the only thing I want to point out about it is that you don't have to actually do these charts. You can use racy as a language in conversation and get a long way uh, towards the clarity that we're recommending. Um, and you can also, I think what's quite brilliant about it as a tool is that you can isolate decisions. So look at line five on this simple chart uh, where we've just called out, where is the approval for this? And that allows you to negotiate for 1A. You, you can actually do a chart of just the decisions that you're going to be making in the course of executing your strategy and clarify that decision, make those decisions and move on from there. So Mark, I think you're gonna be answering some questions that people are posing in the chat about how to think about this with respect to strategy execution. Yes, and I'm gonna build on something you just said, Cassie, because you mentioned the decisions that uh, are quite important to specify uh, the roles in relation to, and, and, and that is um, something that can really be used in strategy execution if you wanna work with that in an agile way, uh, because, um, uh, there, uh, you, you need to be fast, you move fast, and, and then you have this issue that, that an increasing number of strategic initiatives are cross-functional in their nature, and in many cases, the root cause, as we discussed before, is role confusion. So uh, RACI 2.0 is a great method that can be learned by everyone in the organization. At first glance, it's, it seems... Uh, <laughs> You may say easy, but when you dive into it, then you have, Cassie, a lot of negotiation going on and you have people who need to, to not just be part of an agreement, but also remember that agreement. And so, so, so it can be um, not easy in practice. However, it's a language, as Cassie says, that can be learned in practice. And that is a very, very important thing in strategy execution, that you have a language that you can use to talk about roles and avoid role confusion uh, and, 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 and do that in, on, on, on every level in the organization. And um, so um, there are many ways of applying RACI to, to strategy execution. And I'd like to give you one example of this, Cassie, if you could move on to, to the next slide, uh, which is, um, which is a, a RACI matrix done in our platform for, for digitizing strategy execution. And Cassie, maybe you could give your subject matter expert opinion on, on, on what is going on here. 
in, in this slide. Yeah. Um, so what I always say is RACI is perfect. It's almost, the, it's a mirror to the project management charter. If you think about it, because on the y-axis, it has what are we going to do? And across the top, it has the stakeholder analysis, who is going to be involved. And then it, it adds the, the role clarity, but it doesn't have deadlines. And so I think uh, what Decide Act has done and some other tools have done is so you just add a column. You have to have a deadline for each one of these activities and uh, and a progress bar, which is very helpful. The other thing that I love about this application is that you can um, add this R prime role, which I think really enhances accountability. I actually want to say that word one more time. All of the roles have accountability. The R prime is accountable for getting the work done. The A is accountable for the quality of their decisions and the C's are accountable for the quality of their advice. So um, by by using it in this way, you capture this. And I think this actually goes very nicely, Mark, into our next poll because yeah, just, we're curious just one, about... Maybe sorry, just one more back? thing. Yeah, just one yeah. more thing because uh, I've seen so many and uh, I've seen them um, saved on, you know, on SharePoint and... Uh, in, you know in many places so so when it is in a digital platform which i like it to be uh it allows you to automatize the follow-up on the strategy execution and and each person in the organization can get his or her own overview of, of, of what uh, he she is responsible for in relation to this racy uh, 2.0 uh, terminology and that has a huge impact on the ability of the organization to actually uh, reach its uh, strategic targets. So just a comment to what you just said, Cassie. You no, know, thanks, Mark, because that was actually a question in the chat. So Rah Rohit, will you please run this poll for us? I think as Mark was saying, um, we digitized anything in a company in order to make it visible to everyone. So, you know, in the old days, command and control was the only way that you could operate because all of the important information was uh, held up at the top of the organization. And now we've kind of democratized information. We can push information to the edge, which we'll talk about empowerment in a moment. And, and it's the same with strategy. Can you make the strategy visible to everyone who's responsible for executing? Mm -hmm. Mark, I think, did you want to have a comment on this as well? Well, I could share a uh, fresh example uh, from a meeting last with uh, one of our, uh, one from the meeting. And, and we were discussing how much they actually spend every week on boarding. They have 18 strategic initiatives. And it turned out that they have, they spend around 10 to 12 hours every month per initiative on putting things together to be able to report to the executive management team uh, because they have their information in, in many different documents. So uh, a quick uh, math exercise uh, concluded that uh, by putting it into a digital platform uh, will save them for more than 2,500 work hours per year, which in this case is more than $200,000 just for that specific activity, uh, which so, 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 so that number of work hours can then be allocated to more value creating activities. Um, and uh, so yeah, Mark, so we're sharing results. What do you yeah. think? Well, I think that uh, uh, luckily only 4% uh, answers uh, in my head where it's safe. In my experience, that's not <laughs> for the entire organization the best place to be, but uh, I know that it can be a challenge to, to find a way, a place to, 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 to document those roles. I think that... Um, this is, uh, as I would expect, a lot of it takes place in spreadsheets. And um, I mean, I use spreadsheets in, in my work uh, constantly, but uh, for other things. But um, the thing is, it can be forgotten where they are, the roles. And I guess that's in line with your um, experience, Cassie, yeah. when it comes to role confusion. I was with a company a, a couple of months ago and they said, you know, we used to take the leaders away to do the strategy and they would come back and would be like, here it is. Uh, and it was really mostly in their heads, I think. But now, you know, they want more participation, more open strategy. Um, and then they want to share it with more people. Hmm. So, Mark, I think you've got. Yeah. And I think it also, about this. 
I think actually this slide is, is the answer to one of the questions uh, in the chat. And by the way, Mary Beth, I agree with you that everyone is responsible for strategy. And 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 then one of the things that you can do to to move faster is to to use a digital platform when working with race because you can some 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 of the things that that you get out of it is that it can integrate with the organizational structure. You can have cross-functional work groups. Uh, you can have some very dynamic overviews of roles and responsibilities and a very user-friendly my page feature. Uh, so so you can remove a lot of time-consuming uh, follow-up um, activities and 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 spend the time on discussing what to do with the situation we're in and how can we move forward and who should do what and uh, instead of um, discussing where we are because that's something that that you already uh, have as information so so workflow automation opportunities um, are some of the reasons why, why why you should do it there's one other thing i want to add um mark because i worked a couple of years ago with a gas to liquid company in the middle east and they spent 18 months documenting 1200 processes and that was the what so they were they were beautiful but at the end they realized that they hadn't spent any time thinking about the who. And as Tyru said, who was going to get the work done and who was going to make the decisions. And so they they brought us in to, and they said, we'd like you to race the 1,200 processes. And they wanted this very important pivot, which Decide Act is able to provide. Because they said, once we've done that, then show it to me by person. Show me what Cassie's you know, portfolio of responsibilities looks like. Show me what, you know, Mark's portfolio of decisions looks like so that I can think about it from an HR perspective and not just from a flowchart perspective. Um, and I think that that's one of the things we're really looking to achieve in a digitization of RACI is that the ability to do that pivot. So I want to make sure we have time for questions, but I can't leave us without some conversation about the relationship between Racy and empowerment, and why empowerment is increasingly important in today's business. And we talked a little bit about command and control, uh, moving towards flatter organizations where the decisions can be made closer to the information. And now as we have AI and generative AI coming on, closer to the intelligence that is being pushed to the edge. So, you know, I say the most basic definition of empowerment is can you push decisions or A's down in the organization? And if you can't point to specific decisions that you can delegate down, don't talk about empowerment because it just makes people cynical. So a few more thoughts about empowerment. I don't think it is like an on-off switch. It's not bin binary. We think, oh, I should empower my people because I'm a good leader. Or, oh, I'm not empowering my people, so I'm not a good leader. There's also a lot of value judgment involved in this. But it's really much more like a journey. It's also different with different people and on different projects. And I just want to propose that there are different conditions or ingredients of empowerment that you have to take into consideration when you're thinking about what degree of empowerment you are comfortable with. And the first one is just how familiar am I with you? Do I, do I know you? Do I know your company if we're working across companies? Do we have experience together? That's the second ingredient. And finally, this third ingredient, really important for innovation work, uh, is are we doing something novel that we've never done before? Because if we are, it's much harder for me to give you clear direction. I may not know what it is I actually want you to go off and do. And without understanding some of the nuance of empowerment, you get a kind of dysfunction where people try to give away the work and then they don't like what happens next. And then the senior level people step back in again and either take the work back or take the decision back or reverse the course. And all of these things, of course, are enormously frustrating. And this is one of the reasons the tech company that I'm working with reached out because in their employee engagement survey for the last few years, there has just been a tremendous amount of frustration about where decision-making lives in the organization and who is and is not empowered to move forward. So I will move us to our key messages slide um, and just begin by tying it back to what we said at the beginning about speed and Mark, what you said about time to market. 
being increasingly important in business because our competitors are moving quickly. The life sciences company that I worked with last year, Merck Germany, announced that they were doubling the productivity of their R&D division. Uh, and that was a pretty public commitment to, to doubling their speed. The second is to say, look at RACI 2.0, up, update the classic RACI, and use it to create the role clarity and to create empowerment when you're working cross-functionally, because almost all strategy execution is cross-functional. Yeah, and, and the third key message is that you can use a digital platform and and, and thereby apply RACI 2.0 in a very user-friendly, modern, and effective way. That's So we have two, two calls to action. A couple of people have mentioned uh, that they like this slight revision of RACI 2.0. Where, where can I read more about it? Uh, there's a very good white paper, if I say so myself, uh, on our website. Racy Solutions, that's a great place to start. Uh, and you can learn more about the Side Act, Mark. Yeah, and I just want to tell you, Cassie, I've read it and it's quite good. So <laughs> um, also, I mean, I know that um, when it comes to strategy execution, there's no size that fits all. So um, whenever I say digitize strategy execution, I am fully aware it needs to be customized to the culture, to the management style and everything. And I would be happy to, to, to have a conversation about that. So just reach out to, to the site act on the, on the landing page that you have here and um, would be great to discuss that. I think I'll keep this slide up just for a yeah. moment with our contact information. Tyru, we did yeah, it. Thank you. Thank, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. For taking us through this, uh, uh, tool uh, to help actually when it comes to strategy execution. Uh, it is important to have uh, clarity who is doing what, who is accountable and so on. And I'm glad that you were calling uh, on the way we define at PMI uh, A, accountability. Uh, clearly, uh, accountability, as we say it, is not something to be delegated. Accountability will rest with the person who is ultimately accountable and then of course uh, you may delegate decision making uh, element the, uh, to the team as a mean of empowering but at the end uh, as we see in accountability the book will stop with uh, that ultimate person now there are many questions the audience uh, engaged and i want to thank uh, the attendees with uh, actually answering the survey and so on and the poll questions that were being asked we really appreciate it let's start with um, there are a few uh, so I'll start with the one that deals more specifically with uh, the presentation, and then if we have time, we could get to uh, others. Uh, let's start with uh, uh, the question from Denise, who is asking, is there a formalized document with the RACI 2.0 chat and definitions? Yes, and this is what uh, is the RACI 2.0 white paper that can be downloaded from this site. Thanks, Denise, for Excellent. asking that. And then there is one uh, from Shalina, and uh, usually she said there is an addition to the RACI, there is that S, RACI. And uh, that question could align with what uh, Enrico also had, where Enrico says sometimes he sees, uh, she sees, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know the gender here, uh, RACI, DASI, RAPI, DIS, DC, RC. Uh, so of all these framework for making decision uh, or for clarifying roles, is the one that is preferable than the other? So two things. I like RASCI. I use it all the time. If you have that distinction, you use one R, that's a rule, and then all of the other workers are become the S. So you don't need the R prime that I propose. I would say this. I think Daisy is very similar. Uh, having any kind of decision rights tool is so much better than having none at all. Um, and all of them, including Rapid, which is Bain's, I think can be used to great effect for strategy execution. Um, there's only one I don't like, and I want to say that online. But if you call me, I'll tell you which which one to stay away from. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so she she's taking the fifth year, which is good. <laughs> now let let go to uh, an earlier question uh, from uh, MD Faisal Faisal Alam, where he says, "How can we define uh, that the strategy will be successful?" How does uh, every such work on time? Because, you know, sometimes, I mean, would it be successful or not? Mm. How would you know? That's that's a really good question. And that's also why all the different kinds of analysis that are getting done on 
how successful strategies are, in fact, are quite, you know, you can go into the methodology applied in that analysis and challenge that, which I think is a fair thing to do, by the way. Uh, I normally um, define a strategy as, um, as su successful if what you intended to do, you have started to do to do that. And when you are following the direction that you set out at the beginning and you end up getting done the things that are needed to get the impact you want to get out of your strategic initiative. So it's, it's, a, it's not about doing what you set out to do from the beginning it's also about only it's not only about that it's also about being agile and and adjust according to what happens and and always have in mind the impact you are there to to get and not just deliver something you need to to to, to have the impact focus if that's yeah yeah no no i i like that answer because of course there is a the discovery there is the discovery phase as well you tr i mean you draft your strategy you start implementing uh, things goes maybe sometime as you plan, sometime not as you plan, and as you nicely mm -hmm. said, it is the ability to rebound and uh, kind of pivot, shift, and uh, and and learn and then move on. So a priori definition of will be successful would mean like uh, uh, knowing having a crystal blue a ball, and uh, often I mean customer may not react as you want. Uh, the assumption that you make may not be what the customer would actually realize. But uh, it is also success if you see that it's not working as you want, and then you're able to shift and get to the one that takes you where you want. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I, Tyra, I just want to also... say, especially in innovation work, where we start out on one path, and then we need to do product market fit and explore the suitability of the strategy, and then pivot as quickly as we can based on what we learn. So. Yeah, so one, one question uh, that is coming from Shelina. Of course, you decided to be racy, but how do you ensure that they re everyone has their required information? Communication becomes challenging when moving fast with many people. So I know there was a question regarding where it is put in my head in a spreadsheet and so on. <laughs> so how do you, do you, do you make sure that uh, everybody has their required there's a, information? There's a classic problem that you hear when you talk about racy, which is, we spend all this time building the racy and then we put it in the drawer and we never look at it again. But I think this is why our digit digitizing strategy really is a great strength because uh, I would say two things. You can share that information now across the organization. Um, and then I also really encourage people to use racy as a language when they talk to each other and in their meetings to keep that conversation about the roles alive but it's so much better than a spreadsheet that goes in the drawer with your strategy that no one looks at again to, to digitize it. Cassie, Mark, there are a few more questions there. Of course, we have only five minutes, so I'll give you the floor to have some closing remarks. And if there is anything that you want to address. Thanks, Tyru. Um, I think I just want to obliquely answer one of the questions in the Q&A. Um, how often do you need to update the RACI content? I really think of working with RACI as a capability and being able to audit your organization's decision architecture as a, as a capability. And it's increasingly important to build that capability if you're gonna work in cross-functional teams. So it's not just a project management tool on a piece of paper in the drawer, it's, it's a way of thinking. And, uh, and so the, the short answer is you update the RACI as you go along, as the situation uh, changes in this very dynamic world that we're living in. Mark. Yeah, just want to emphasize one thing. Uh, we've discussed the um, importance of moving fast, but uh, obviously um, strategy execution is, is not just about running fast, moving fast. It's about doing the right things and do them in an intelligent way. So, so therefore, you really need to, to pay attention to, 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 to having the role clarity in place so that you can make as... It's said here in the chat, informed decisions by the right people. And, and that will make you agile and able to move fast, fast and, and, and get more impact out of your activities. Wonderful. W wonderful. Thank you so much again for this great uh, presentation. And uh, we'll continue with the Transformation Talk series. So we'll have uh, more on, on, on the road. And again, um, uh, we like the engagement. We, the, the intent really is what our intent is. You're developing strategies. We want the strategy to become reality. You're transforming an organization 
we want the transformations to be successful. Uh, as we mentioned often, 70% failure rate. And this, what uh, Cassie and Mike have shared, for me, it is really, really important. Whenever you have a strategy, clarifying who is doing what, and then creating that clarity is actually a way of, again, engaging the whole company and making sure that you achieve more success. And then if there are some, uh, let's say, pinch point, you have ways of addressing them. So really, I hope you got uh, some takeaways that you can apply. And then, of course, uh, you saw the contact that uh, both have shared. Please uh, do feel uh, free to reach out as well. And uh, until then, I look forward to see you at the next Transformation Talk. Take care. Thank you. And have a wonderful day. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Taru. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Kezi. Bye.